Hi, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and you know how to explain grace and justification when others have questions about our faith. Tonight on EWTN Live, our guest will show you how to do that explanation. But the only justification you need for tuning into EWTN Radio is that you want to listen to quality, uplifting, and encouraging programming. And here to tell us about some of that, please welcome EWTN's General Manager for Radio, Mr. Jack Williams, who's also my faithful sidekick on my show. How are you? Fabulous, Father Mitch. How are you? Fine, thanks. thanks. You know, you talk about people listening to EWTN Radio because they want to. Yeah. But that's not the only thing they can do because I'm here to tell people that I can help them fulfill one of their baptismal requirements. Which is? To be an evangelist. Oh, I thought it was not getting all wet. It doesn't mean they have to be on a soapbox in the town square preaching the gospel, although yep. if they wanted to, that would be fantastic. Yes. But you know what they can do? They can tell a friend to listen to EWTN yep. radio, and they can let you do the heavy lifting. Yep. You yep. know, uh, so many people in our culture today are adrift in a sea of loneliness or mm -hmm. despair. Mm -hmm. Uh, hurting from one thing or another with no land in sight and they're looking for a dove with a sprig of greenery yeah. and that's what EWTN radio does we provide that for people it, there's also a lot of folks who want to be able to explain their faith or understand it they don't know how to put it into words so this is another service that we try to provide. Absolutely. You know, we can catechize those who have not been catechized, those who have been catechized poorly, or those who want to continue their formation in the faith. All of those things are available for them at EWTN Radio. Many platforms. You can hear us uh, at EWTN.com on the EWTN app. All the major streaming program platforms, uh, we're on everything there. Over 380 AM, FM radio stations around the United States. To find out where you can find EWTN Radio, just go to EWTN Radio or EWTN.com slash radio, and my information will be there. If you don't have an AM, FM station in your area and you think the Lord may be tugging at your heart to get something going, send me an email, jwilliams at EWTN.com, and I'd be happy to walk you through the process of how so many of these other folks around the country have made that happen. I, it's been primarily lay people who have done this. Almost exclusively, with yep. no radio experience whatsoever. Yep. Yep, and there's, my favorite was walking in the guy's house, and he's got it in his living room. That's the whole radio station. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate Thank you, that Father a lot. Appreciate and it. we want you to go to ewtn.com slash radio to find a station in your area. We'll be right back with tonight's guest in 30 seconds, so please stay with us. Welcome back, and this is EWTN Live. I want to mention that today is the Feast of the Korean Martyrs. There are 103 of them canonized by St. John Paul II back in 1984. One of them is St. Andrew Kim Taegon, who was only 25 years old. He was martyred in uh, 1846, born in 1821. His, the church had actually come into Korea some years ahead, about 75, 60 years earlier, from lay people. They were bringing the faith and evangelizing Koreans, including Japanese Christians who had come there to uh, uh, evangelize. And uh, St. Uh, Andrew was the first Korean Catholic priest but he was martyred just 13 months after his ordination to the priesthood. Uh, also, we commemorate Father, uh, you know, Paul Chong Hassang, who was born early in 1794 and died in 1839. Um, 
there was his father and his uncle who wrote the first catechism of the Catholic Church in Korea. Uh, they did uh, marvelous work. And eventually, there were about 10,000 martyrs who died in the persecution that extended over about a 100-year period. But now, the fruit of it, you know the great saying uh, that, that came from uh, Tertullian, that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. And Korea, South Korea anyway, is on its way to becoming the second Christian country in Eastern Asia, along with the Philippines. And we want to pray especially for North Korea. Uh, it's a very dangerous game that the politicians are playing with nuclear weapons and rockets and such. And we pray that their leader, who's also, last name is Kim, um, that they would use the wealth that they gain to build up their people in peace and bring them prosperity and not promote war. So let's pray for that and that peaceful resolutions come to the Korean Peninsula. Good to ask Our Lady of Fatima for peace. All right, we have a guest tonight. He was an evangelical pastor for 10 years before he and his family entered the Catholic Church in 1990. And after a challenge from Pope St. John Paul II to stand up for the family, he founded Family Life Center International in 1992. Its purpose was to encourage and equip faith, family life, and fatherhood at a time when that's collapsing. His conversion to Catholicism led him to write a new book. It's called Grace and Justification, an Evangelical Guide to Catholic Beliefs. So please welcome Mr. Steve Wood. Thank you, Father. Steve. Steve. It is so good to have you back here at the EWTN. You used to have a program uh, on uh, fatherhood, and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful series. And it's good to have you back here. I understand that you're now moving past fatherhood to grandfatherhood. I am. And I need to give a shout out. My grandson just moved today from Denver to our hometown in Greenville, South Carolina, and I wasn't there to welcome him, so. Hello, Caleb. I'll give him a shout out. All right. All right. You wrote this book. Now, did you write this book, Grace and Justification, with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation getting started in mind? Or is that just the way things worked? Well, twofold. One, I've felt a compulsion for years to write the book I wish I had when I was struggling with the doctrine of justification. And just to clarify what we're talking about, we're in a state of unrighteousness and we're in need of righteousness or justification. Or type and by of we, not just you and I, but th this is the Every, case for that's the whole the human, human race. Uh, exactly. So how you are justified, how do you come into a, a covenant relationship with God? And Quite honestly, I had a very, I was taught incorrectly uh, as an evangelical pastor and seminary and such. And unfortunately, every Catholic I encountered except one over a period of 20 years uh, reinforced my misconceptions about what Catholics believe about grace and justification. So I wanted to write it and been working on it actually on and off for years. But you know, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation is huge. There are books being published for adults and children. There are tours to Germany, special celebrations, conferences. So it's a prime opportunity for Catholics to bring the topic up. It's a topic of conversation. Yes. Uh, Protestant friends are going to be uh, dealing with it. By the way, I need to mention to our listeners that one person yes. I encountered over a 20 year period yeah. was you. Oh. You were on the John Ankerberg show. Um, I was a big fan of probably the most popular and strongest Catholic apologist, Walter Martin, Dr. Walter Martin. And uh, he's a Protestant apologist. Protestant apologist. And I was watching this show with my wife, and this young priest comes on to defend 
justification, Catholic viewpoint. This is a long time ago. It was it? a long time ago, but I felt sorry for you, Father. I was rooting for the Protestant at the time. I was a pa Protestant pastor, but I was thinking there's not a leg to stand on. Catholics don't have this right, and he is just going to crush this poor priest. But by the time we got to the break, I said to my wife, Karen, you know, he's not doing a bad job. <laughs> and you were the first one who could articulate it. And so besides for the evangelical world, I also want the Catholic world to have a tool so that they can know the richness of the Catholic faith when it comes to justification and be able to share that with others. It, what's important about your book is that it's not about just coming up with arguments to refute Protestants in a debate. That's not the purpose. No, no, no. The issue of justification, of having our sins forgiven and being made right by God's grace before God, before we get to the judgment seat of God, that is a key issue. If we don't have a concern of how we get our sins forgiven and how we stand as righteous before God, in his eyes, not our own, it, it, we're in trouble. We need this doctrine we do. for our spiritual life. Well, if you don't have this one right, nothing else follows because it's how you approach God, the, the title grace and justification, the catechism, and if you can think of something from 1996, I can't remember anything famous from that year, but that's the section of the catechism says, our justification comes from the grace of God. And the Protestant is very likely to believe that as a Catholic, you believe that your justification comes from something you do, like Doing I tried to be a good person or, or whatever else. And you know, it's, it's ultimately due to God. He's the primary reason. We can't justify ourselves, no matter, that would be like going out in the backyard and I'm saying, Father Mitch, see if you can jump up and touch the moon. You'd say, you're crazy. Well, trying to justify yourself is just as crazy. It's yeah. something that God does on our behalf. I like to use, the, I, I wrote a book uh, called Winning the Battle Against Sin, in which I go to the parable we recently heard about how many times do I have to uh, forgive my brother? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. And in there, you know, the, the translation that they use at Mass is kind of namby-pamby. You know, it says a large amount. The amount is specific. It's 10,000 talents. A talent was 65 pounds of gold. So this is 650,000 pounds of gold. This is the kind of money the federal government tries to spend. Right. <laughs> and the other guy owed only a hundred denarii, just a, you know, a few bucks. So for us to pay back God is comparable to paying a debt of 650,000 pounds of gold. We can't do it. Our sins are overwhelming. Well, one of the major difficulties that's allowed this contest between Protestants and Catholics to go on for five centuries, five centuries, that's a long time. Too long. But uh, I didn't realize it, but Protestants and Catholics have differing definitions of justification. Whereas in the Protestant conception, it's the very first moment that you express faith, you are justified, boom, done, over, that's it. In Catholicism, justification relates to your whole Christian life. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty obvious why the Protestants don't want to have anything following their initial act of faith because that's, that's it, that's all justification is in the Protestant and uh, conception, whereas in Catholicism, yes, it's gonna go through your whole life. And Protestants do realize you're supposed to do good works, not and from- And they, they yeah. don't realize it, they do they, them. They abs absolutely do. But it's because of these two definitions going past each other mm -hmm. that, that you really don't quite see. But the interesting thing, I asked the, um, uh, the question in my book, how much of a book or a piece of literature is usually devoted to its theme. 
And of course, even rookie authors know it's supposed to be the whole thing, a high school term paper. Your theme has to pervade your piece of literature. Well, Paul's epistle to the Romans in the Protestant setting, justification is only that first moment. That's only two chapters out of 16 in Romans. Whereas in the Catholic notion, it's the whole epistle is devoted mm -hmm. to justification. Right. It's, it's running right through. So it's not like one uses the Bible, one doesn't. No, if the Catholics are at fault, they're at fault for using more of the Bible for justification than Protestants do. That's I, 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 uh, another book I've done this year on the theme of being saved is trying to show the a Catholic approach doesn't eliminate passages from the Bible. The purpose of Catholic doctrine is to integrate the whole of the Bible. You see the full truth of the Word of God and live it. That's, that's Catholic notions of salvation and justification. And that's one of the things that to be very effective with an evangelical, you really want to not be combative as much as try to open the scriptures up in yes. a fuller sense. Yes. And when they see that, that uh, there's more grace taught in Catholic understanding than in Protestant, when they, and they, they think the Catholic Church is gonna deny grace, and when they start seeing in their own Bible that there's more of it within the Catholic faith, well, then that becomes attractive. In that it is rooted in revelation, in scripture. Right. It's not something that is a theologian coming up with a theory, it's trying to maintain the balance of the whole of the Word of God and not take a verse out of context. That's the, you know what, what Catholics are trying to do, but I don't think, uh, one of the points you make, we don't communicate it very clearly. We don't know how to put that into words. I went 20 years, Yep. except for you. Here I am tonight, so <laughs> hopefully, but it's really, it's an opportunity to learn this. Uh, I sent the book to my son in Colorado he opened the book and he's staying with an evangelical family. As soon as the wife saw the book, she said, I, I'd like to read that. Why? Because Catholics believe in grace and justification. They sure right. do. That's right. They sure do and giving an opportunity. There's one area though that uh, it's an interesting thread in my life. As you mentioned, I've been involved a whole lot with Catholic fatherhood the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And is that kind of a trail here? And then I've been working on this book off and on for years. And if there's one thing I would say would be a critical difference and that it's so enriching is that in the Protestant notion of justification, your concept of God is fundamentally and primarily a judge. You're guilty with sin. You come into the courtroom, it's a courtroom setting, and the judge being merciful pronounces you not guilty which is a blessing, don't get me wrong, yeah, yeah. and then you leave, okay, that's, that's it. In Catholicism, you're a prodigal son, and uh, in the Garden of Eden through original sin, we lost our inheritance. And so what the Catholic notion of God is not a judge, but a father, a father mm -hmm. who forgives, who restores sonship. And the idea of adoption, being a son or a daughter of God, is right in the center of the Catholic notion of justification. In the Council of Trent, when they dealt with justification, they have a little summary paragraph. You know, as a convert, I kept reading that. I said, well, no, this isn't, this isn't a definition of just, no, it isn't. Because in Protestantism, it's just not guilty, done. In Catholicism, it's a transfer from being a son of Adam to a son of God, daughter of God. That's the highest privilege there is to come into God's family. And when you start seeing that, mm -hmm. that's pretty good stuff. And it doesn't completely eliminate the role of God as judge. I mean, no, as no. a father, right. you had to judge certain issues. Oh, I did? <laughs> All right, who did this, right? Yeah, exactly. And you, had a, and, and you were probably pretty good, like most parents are, 
at knowing which one, uh, the, the kid with ice cream on his face ate the ice cream. You can figure these things My out. My kids claim I, I'm not good at it, but, oh, but whatever. I'm, I'm yeah. fair. I'll yeah. give myself a, a B. Okay. <laughs> and my parents were good. And so, because I always got caught. But the, uh, the, so there is an element of fatherhood that's a judge mm -hmm. of certain circumstances, but it's in the context of this other relationship as father, not primarily a legal relationship. Exactly, because if it's illegal, it's an external decree. Okay, that's the Protestant notion. In mm -hmm. the Catholic notion, you're not only decreed just, but you're made just. God transforms the inner part of you. Why? Because he wants you in his family <coughs> and he wants you to share his life. That's what grace is, the sharing the very life of God. So this is just like, the incredible richness that uh, is in scriptures and Protestants realize this who know their Bible, but they don't connect it with justification. I think the, the problem, you know, when I was debating Walter and have had other debates, I think that the problem goes to more of an understanding of human beings that are different between Protestants and Catholics. Luther and Calvin denied that you have free will to choose grace. You can't choose to make an act of faith. Now, many Protestants don't follow Luther and Calvin on that. Billy Graham, uh, who's still alive in uh, Carolina, and um, he always would preach, make a decision for Christ. But Luther and Calvin said, you can't right. make a decision. That's why they add the word justification by faith alone, by grace alone. You, grace makes you believe, or if you don't get the grace, you can't believe. And that's a key difference for us. Catholics believe you. Grace works on your free will, but you make a choice. And that, uh, and that again, is part of the relationship. That, that, that's key. Well, again, I'd, I'd say if you want a picture of the Catholic vision of justification, it's the prodigal son. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, grace was operative when, it, when he was feeding pigs <laughs> and mm -hmm. came to himself. That's right. And then he made the motions back to the father, and then the father comes and, and greets him and restores his sonship, gives him the robe and the ring, and he's, he's back in the family. And that's Catholic justification. And honestly, when I've even in, quote, debates or kind of hostile <laughs> settings, when you start talking about God's fatherhood relating to justification, the Catholic notion of it, it gets quiet because something very deep inside of us is built to respond to the Father's love. That's why Jesus came to restore us to the Father and the Holy exactly. Spirit uh, to unify. So that's probably about the deepest part of a human being. And Catholicism, when it comes to justification, taps that. It's really good news. It's yeah. incredible news. Very much so. And we have a lot of people who are just stuffing themselves with opioids and alcohol and all kinds of uh, sexual experiences trying to find some kind of inner peace. This is, this is, this is it. And they're not. Uh, you yeah. know, the, it, the, it's, um, I was talking, we were talking at dinner uh, with a priest who's here from Kenya. And, uh, you know, he really likes the image of how when the demons wanted to go into the pigs, they destroyed them. Mm -hmm. And when our, if we don't let Christ completely drive out the, 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 the sin inside of us, the demonic inside of us, we self-destruct with you know, various drugs, uh, sexual experience that destroys relationships in so many ways and many other self-destructive uh, possessions and materialism. They are self-destructive. The grace of justification is to bring us life. And continue that as well yep. because it's not like you go and have an altar call, say, I believe in Jesus, and then go out and just go your merry way apart from Christ because you'll just return right to the situation you were before then. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's so important 
to have a biblical definition of justification, which is the historic one, which is the Catholic one that pervades the whole Christian life. It's mm -hmm. something that continues and God provides the grace to do that continuing. As I mentioned to you this afternoon, I'm very concerned with a lot of our young people, both Protestant and Catholic. They're, mm -hmm. as you know, they're falling away in their late teens and 20s, mm -hmm. left and right. And you know, if you're trying to live the Christian life on your own steam in today's world, you're not going to get too far, no. particularly as a no. young person. You need lots of grace and have your trust in Christ, and then that yoke becomes easy, the burden becomes light, living the moral life becomes something achievable because you're not depending on your own steam. You're having the power of the Holy Spirit as a child of God. Yeah, the, the pressure to leave uh, the, a life of faith, uh, and Protestant pastors talk to me about it. Their young people are also leaving yep. in large numbers, um, or they're becoming nothings. So they're not you know, against the faith, they're not for it, they just are afraid to make a decision. Not unlike the way they're afraid to become married. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're afraid to fail, so they don't get involved. Uh, they don't try. And this is something where you've got to have the grace of God, that relationship, and accept that love that God gives you to change you. And I think we really need to double up on grace and the way we teach it in a sense that we are to live a moral life. But before you even talk about that, you need to talk about how you have a relationship with God, which comes by simply trusting, believing in His goodness. Okay, it's not I'm trying to be a good person, I'm trying to live on my own steam, mm -hmm. but you're depending on His grace. Okay, then we can talk about commandments for a while, but before we go home, we just want to remind you one more time that our primary dependence is on Jesus Christ, not ourselves exactly. to do this. Exactly, that centeredness on Jesus Christ as our Lord, whom we invite in. That's what the Eucharist is about, letting Jesus inside of you and letting Him nourish you daily with Himself, not just with stuff, but Himself. Yes, and the, the, you know, a lot of Catholics think it's a checklist, you know, or a balance sheet. You know, if I do more good things than bad things or something, that's not it. No, that's Egyptian religion. <laughs> yeah, I was to say, it's not Christianity <laughs> by no, any means. No, but no. you know, you, you ask the average Catholic and even a lot of Protestants, and that's what you'll hear. Yeah. And that's not the gospel. Yeah, the, the, the Egyptian god of death, Tot, I think it was, uh, would have a, a, a balance and he'd put your good deeds on one side and a feather on the other. And if your good deeds could outweigh the feather, you, you might get into their idea of paradise. But um, that's not it. I know. I'd like to really encourage Catholics, though, to take this opportunity this fall to spread the good news of God's grace in the Catholic faith. You know, there's something stirring in the evangelical world. A few years back, I attended a meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society. It came to my neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. It was down in Atlanta. And that year, the theme of all the workshops, the main talks, was justification. And this is almost after five centuries, and it was the largest attendance they've ever had at any of their annual conferences. Mm -hmm. So, you know, justification is a hot topic in the evangelical yes. world. And we're coming up on an anniversary that's just going to even intensify that. So what are we going to do? Let's let the opportunity pass no. or go back. This is the stinger that caused the rift between Protestantism and Catholicism that divided the Western church in two. And it's not going to be solved. When, when I was interested in becoming a Catholic, this is the single most important issue I had to solve because I didn't feel in conscience I could become a Catholic unless I saw that Catholicism indeed taught that our justification, our salvation was by the grace of you God. You wanted to make sure that the Catholic doctrine is rooted in sacred scripture, what Absolutely. God has told us about himself and not what somebody's making up. Exactly. I, I want to encourage, uh, we, we, we've got this, this book here, it's called Grace and Justification. Um, we want you to get that from our religious catalog. Uh, you can go to EWTNRC.com to, to order it, 
or, or call 1-800-854, I think it's 6316. And while you're there, I urge you to also get my book, Saved, a Bible study for Catholics on salvation. They go together. They complement each other. And of course, if you want to learn more about Steve Wood's Apostolate Family Life Center International, just go to dads.org, D-A-D-S dot org. You need a lot of work on that area too. Well, we're going to come back in about two minutes. We want to get questions from you calling in as well as from our studio audience. So please stay with us. All right, uh, before we get going, I want to mention that today we have a special blessing for Tommy Schlein from Quero, Texas. Dag nabbit. Uh, happy birthday to you. I understand you're getting old. <laughs> and keep enjoying it. It's fun getting older, right? God bless you. Come back any time, whether it's your birthday or not. All right, you ready for some questions? Let's go. All right, let's giddy up. Start off with uh, this lady. Ma'am, where are you from? San Antonio, Texas. Good. See, we got, we got a lot of Texans in here today. Be careful. Good ways. So what is your question, ma'am? This question is for Mr. Woods. I understand you know something in regard to reincarnation, something to the fact of uh, Edgar Casey. Yes. Can you explain something in regard to that? They're, they're going to kick me out of here if I start telling that story. Yeah. Uh, I was in the US Navy and um, kind of got done with the party scene, started thinking there might be meaning in life, so mm -hmm. I wandered out to the Edgar Casey Institute, which I don't recommend anybody do. Mm. And there I was taught reincarnation, a lot of the early New Age kind of things. Um, but it's also where I bought my first Bible. Uh, I remember the ohms where you try to get your harmony with the universe. Mm -hmm. So I did ohms going down the line of the different Bibles. They had counterfeit Bibles and genuine. By the grace of God, I got a real one. But I was trying to free my karma. I was told by my guru that uh, in order to free my karma, I was born into Christianity. I had to read the Bible in order to free my karma to move to higher states of consciousness. So I bought a Bible, and um, lady where I bought it said, would you pray before you read this? And I did, and I freed my karma. But it wasn't me. You see, in reincarnation, this is exactly what we're talking about here. Reincarnation is like trying to jump up in your backyard and touch the moon. You could come back and go through any number of incarnations, thousands of them. You'll never deserve to get to heaven. You'll never deserve union with God. That's why Jesus came down. So it's, it's by God's grace. We don't lean on ourselves. Mm -hmm. We lean on God. That's why Jesus came. And, and even though I was reading the Bible, for it didn't click until I realized that I was looking for an enlightenment experience. And I came across John chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And part of the darkness is our own selfish, proud will. And that enlightenment isn't in an experience. It's a person who wants to have a union, a covenant union with us. So it's by grace 
we come in union with God, not by something we do to free ourselves. And it's important to note that Edgar Cayce was himself a Sunday school teacher. He taught Bible classes at a Sunday school. I started at, attending his church. Yeah, and, and it was he was an evangelical, uh, and yet he believed in something that contradicts the Bible, where you see in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 11, Go ahead, and you know, uh, that uh, he, he, not that I've seen a different verse, that's Isaiah 47, but in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 11, it says uh, it is an abomination to conjure up the spirits of the dead to go to mediums and such. And everybody who does those abominations becomes an abomination. Do you want to become an abomination? by trying to channel these other spirits and such? You actually come under the power of darkness, exactly. which appears as light. It isn't the light. Exactly. Uh, and that's why you trust in Christ rather than these uh, different practices that enables you to be enlightened. And one other good verse to know, and you should tell your relatives, um, in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it says, you die once, and then comes the judgment. What part of once don't you get? <laughs> That's it. That's it. So let's go it's to It's very important call. what we do. Yep. yep. We have Beth on the line. Beth, where are you calling from? North Carolina. Great. And your question? Well, it's a combination of question and a comment. I am a Protestant. And um, I enjoy EWTN. I really enjoy everything. It's been such a blessing. And I feel the tug of the Holy Spirit somewhat to consider conversion. But let me ask about the comment that was made about Protestants thinking that God is the judge versus the Father. Okay, go ahead. Because as a Protestant, I've always known that God was my Heavenly Father and that He loved me and that any correction or anything was for my good. So I don't know, can you just, I came in in the middle of this, so if you could just kind of clarify what the gentleman was saying about Protestants seeing God as a judge. Absolutely, thank you, Beth. Great, great question. Great. Well, Beth, we're talking about justification, the notion of God when it comes to being made righteous. And in the Protestant setting, it is very much a legal decree. I guarantee your pastor, Beth, when he went to seminary, he told it, this is a, a, a legal decree. I even have a book at home that's uh, written against the Catholic view of justification. The, the cover is a courtroom. Yeah. And it's not yeah. that the Protestants don't believe in God the Father. When it comes to justification, they think it's the judge is the primary paradigm. And part of that is that they don't want anything else after that first moment. For instance, if you read Romans chapters 3 and 4, you'll read all about justification. But as soon as you get to chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, you're going to be talking about adoption, becoming a child of God. They say that has nothing to do with justification. It's related in that it comes afterwards, but it's not part of your justification. Catholicism says, no, that's part of the whole package, that essentially this is a covenant union with God the Father. And, you know, one of the things that I think to help Beth, um, because I've run into this with a lot of other folks as well, a lot of times you're dealing with the teaching of the theologians who see the primary issue as being that of the courtroom. Right. Luther and Calvin strongly emphasized that at the beginning of the Reformation. That's why Luther used the Latin word justification, justificatio, rather than this German word for the same, that translates the same Greek word. The kaisune in Greek can also be translated as rechtfertigung or righteousness. And it gives a different nuance. It's not as legal. But Luther and Calvin emphasized the legal courtroom decision by God. And then you've got the average folks say, but oh, I love God the Father. 
Exactly. You know, well, see, that's there's a, there's that's a difference between the theologians well, and the folks. Yeah, I would dare say um, the vast majority of Protestants exceed their theology because they're in the scriptures mm -hmm. and they're getting the notion, well, of course God's my father, but when your pastor goes off to seminary, <laughs> when they study justification, I guarantee they'll be saying, no, this is a legal decree. Right. It's not that it doesn't have anything to do with you becoming a child of God and adoption. Those are wonderful things, but it's not re related to justification. Yeah. And, and really, again, I kind of come back to how much of Romans, for instance, do you want to use? Because Romans and Galatians, the two mm -hmm. epistles that talk about justification by faith also have Abba, Father. Yes. See, so it's, 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 it's essential to what justification is. And it's not that your pastor, Protestant pastor, is going to deny God's a father. He's not no. going to do that. No. But he's going to deny it has anything to do with justification. Right. They, they'll see that as part of your sanctification that comes exactly. afterwards. Unrelated. Even though 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, especially verse 11, mentions sanctification before Justification. Yeah, you were washed, you were sanctified, you, you were justified. justified. It's not the order that you're taught in Protestant seminary. No. Yeah. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Odessa, Texas. Odessa, Texas. Yeah, I told right. you it's Texas. Texas. Texans in here. Right. <laughs> so what's your question? My question is for you, Father Mitch. It's, it's about the creed. Okay. I've been thinking about this for a long time. Sure. Jesus is the truth. We all know that. Yeah. Why he say to the good thief, when the good thief say, remember me when you're in paradise. And Jesus say, from that, I told you you're going to be with me in paradise. But our creeds say that Jesus died, go down, and then on the third day he rose again. Right. So, what, so how does that fit together? Right? Three days was... Let me explain it to you, <laughs> okay. uh, as Ricky used to say. <laughs> um, in the, um, you have to think about the way words were used at the time of Christ and today. They talk about the paradise of the fathers. This was the place of the dead. You know, all, you know Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the prophets and David and Solomon, they were good men, but they couldn't go to heaven yet, could they? Christ hadn't opened up the kingdom of heaven. He hadn't died on the cross and redeemed us. So they couldn't go to heaven. They went to a place they called in Hebrew, Sheol. But the good, or they also, you see, for instance, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter uh, 16, I think it is, um, where he speaks about being at the bosom of Abraham. Remember Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham? But then the uh, rich guy, who's not named, goes down to suffer. The bosom of Abraham was the way they talked about where the best among the Israelites would go, and you'd be with Abraham. They also called it the paradise of the fathers. So Christ went down, the Saint First Peter chapter 3 says that Christ went down to the prison to preach to all the dead. But the part of that, you know, the, the world of the dead, where the, the great heroes of faith were, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, and so on, that was called the paradise of the fathers. Christ went there, and he told this good thief, he's going to be with me. So he's going to be with him. And then when Christ preaches to those souls, he announces the good news to them, and they can go to heaven after his resurrection. And so the good thief, who is now a canonized saint. The other guy, we don't hear his name. Can you imagine those righteous fathers waiting and Christ comes? with yeah. the good news. Unbelievable. Yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. wonderful sermon that in the Roman Rite we read in the Office of Readings on Holy Saturday morning about the, it was a second century sermon describing that scene when Christ arrives to preach and Adam cries out, Behold my son! Mm. 
you know, because he's obviously a child of Adam. So it's, it's, a, it's a great sermon. I recommend it strongly. We have a caller, Arlene. Where are you calling from? Nebraska. Great. And your question? Well, to me, uh, all life is transforming the justification. I mean, you don't just do it in spurts. I mean, to me, it's the, all of life is transforming from one, to, one thing to another. Mm -hmm. I'm a new convert into the Catholicism. But it looks to me like, you know, you are transformed until you you, you uh, die, you know. Or am I making myself clear? Yeah. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, to, to clarify, We're just you preach, that's all. <laughs> the theologians do have a term called first justification, and that's when that first expression of faith in Christ's sacrifice is made. That's the first moment, but that's not the end of it. It, mm -hmm. it continues. It's the whole life of the faithful Christian. Yeah, if you think of the, you know, the, the, the image of the metanoia, the, the conversion, is that you're going down the wrong path of sin. When you have a conversion, you turn around. That's the initial that's justification. Right. You turn around from the way to hell and start the way back to heaven. And she's right. That's why St. Yeah, Paul... Yeah, you don't do a U-turn and stop. You keep no, going no. the right way. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. You start going, get back on the right <laughs> road and get off the wrong right. one. That'd be ignorant to no, stay on the... No, she's got it. It's, yeah. it's the transforming... Well, part of the reason, I, I sometimes hesitate to bring it up, but, you know, Martin Luther had a very difficult childhood. He had a very difficult yes. father. Very His mother, so. he said one time, beat him almost till he bled, I think, for stealing a nut. And then he went to school and got beaten there. And, you know, that, that really rattles you. And yeah. if you don't have the internal life just in your upbringing and stuff, it can become very difficult to trust God as a father is going to not, not just externally take care of you, but in the core of your being where you may be in great turmoil and, and people with great family life and horrible family life can come into wonderful relationships with Christ, but sometimes that's an extra hurdle, and I think he faced it. Yeah. Okay. I have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Roanoke, Texas. I uh, see. Texas. Told you it was a lot Texas. of Texans here today. Dag nabbit. So what you got? Well, many of our children and family members are leaving the church, mm -hmm. and they're indifferent, and mm -hmm. um, it breaks my heart to see that and but when an, another fan when I try to bring them back or anybody else is trying to bring their family members back into the church they don't always want to they don't want to hear it and they push away even more mm -hmm. I mean and this question is for both of you yeah what can we do I mean we I know we need to pray but yeah. what can we do to to bring them back in because the the Catholic Church is so rich yep Great question, because it's one on the minds and hearts of lots of people uh, listening tonight. What do you recommend? Well, actually, I'm halfway through another book to follow this one called Transforming Grace. And I think we need to rethink ways we try to present the faith to young people. And this might sound very heretical, but do you really develop deep personal relationships in a traditional classroom? because that's where we're really depending on, on conveying this personal relationship with Christ versus one of my daughters uh, takes groups of girls backpacking up in, in the Rockies. And she said after three or four days, you would believe what starts happening, uh, the inside coming out. And you know, Jesus lived with people, his disciples, he lived with them, ate with them, walked with them, served with them. And I'm thinking um, kind of more of a uh, retreat atmosphere, uh, out of mm -hmm. cell phone range, and uh, having a kind of like what the Wyoming Catholic College is doing with their young people. That type of thing, I think, will go a long way. And you don't have to start with preaching the first day out. Just have a big hill, sweat together a little mm -hmm. bit, work together, eat together, and then start sharing the life of Christ together. I think that'd be, that type of thing, I think, would be a wonderful way to start sharing the faith from life to life, and not just 
because if, if it's in a classroom, and I'm not a glance class, but it's almost like you need to have it click first. Then, then you know, like my library is like yours. You, you can't get enough once you make the connection. But mm -hmm. the connection, I think, we can think of different ways to be more winsome with young people to pull them in. I, I think it's, uh, you're exactly right on, that so often we don't watch and listen. We try to give them what we know, but part of it is learning to watch and listen to what's going on inside of them. And if you start telling them that they're wrong, they're just going to, they're very defensive already. Mm -hmm. People, I find a lot of young people are already kind of hurt. They've um, been kind of battered by problem relationships. They are defensive. Uh, they don't want it to be my fault, but they kind of know it is but they don't want to say so, or they don't want to admit to it in, with somebody without knowing that you love them. You know, you can admit wrongdoing more easily when you know somebody loves you and that you love them. And that, that's the relationship part. Mm -hmm. But part of it is learning to sit and watch. You know, I've done a number of retreats where I go fishing with some guys or hunting with guys. Mm -hmm. And in that, it, it's another set of relationships, sometimes just sitting, waiting, you know, with a, a, a line off a boat. And in that, you know, you, you know especially with men, you, you Absolutely. need a lot of quiet. No, you're, you're, you're right on track. And, it, and it's, they have to have the relationship with Christ established before they're even going to be remotely interested in information, religious information oh. or truth. You yeah. know, they're, they're going to be close to it unless they have an experience where, where they can be open to it and relate to it. And that they can see that this re, that your faith resonates in the rest of what you do. And it's not just this narrow band right. of experience. Right. So that's important. No, that was an excellent question. Yeah. It's almost the question of the century. Exactly. Really. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Let's take Bianca, who's calling from Texas. Everybody's from Everybody's Texas. Everybody's from Texas. <laughs> yeah. Never. So, Bianca, what can we do for you? Uh, hello, Mr. Wood. Uh, hello, Father Pacwa. Um, I, my question is, it's for both of you. Uh, I was once in a youth adult group at my Catholic parish, and one of the things that we discussed during one of our get-togethers was some of the other members said that we can do whatever we want because God loves us and has to forgive us. And I disagreed with that. And I was wondering what uh, what you both what, what, what were your opinions on that? <laughs> Thanks, Bianca. We boy, we've heard that before, haven't we? Yes. Well, I can I can come up with a solution for a lot of these type of problems because this is going off the other edge. One, you're trying to be a good person and earn your brownie points for God instead of depending on his grace. And the other is being loosey goosey and just, you know, there's no moral life. If uh, you simply start a habit of five minutes a day, start with the New Testament and Psalms and just five minutes a day in scripture, you're not gonna get that notion. Uh, a prayerful approach to the scripture uh, will start to give you that balance. It, you'll see the mercy of God. Uh, when you blow it, you'll see his forgiveness for you. But on the other hand, you see he's pretty serious about what he says. And you can, you can take that. And, and I think part of it is everybody's injecting their own thought about God or something they see on the internet or hear on TV versus hearing from God himself and letting him transform the mind. Exactly. And, and one thing you might try, Bianca, you know, just grab their car keys and take their car for a ride and see how ready they are to forgive you. And then bring it up to God. You know? See how that works for them. Okay. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it, there, there's a, a false understanding that mercy is all the all the oxen free 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 no it's what you said it's part of the relationship That's right and it's part of that love but we've also run out of time 
and been great to really be with you, been ha good to have you and here. thank you for the john anchorberg show oh my pleasure 20 something years ago and the, the, for you to know too walter and i became good friends we really got That's developed great. a great friendship but hopefully we'll get you back with your next book thank you and i'm going to give you all a blessing so that god's grace enrich you May the Lord bless you and keep and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you know, our Lord really inspired Mother Angelica to begin this network. And he, part of that was that the network would be brought to you by you and not by advertising products. So, as Mother always did, we ask you, to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. Because we have a lot of bills and they keep coming. So thank you for your support.